I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Gary Pernice. Gary received his Bachelor of Arts degree from Oral Roberts University of Tulsa, Oklahoma, where he graduated Dean's List and Magna Cum Laude in 1981, and his doctorate degree from Pepperdine University in Malibu, California in 1984. Gary is a renowned public speaker and can give a riveting testimony on how he survived cancer with extreme odds that later catapulted him into the halls of the White House, presidential palaces, major hospital boards, and a number of Hollywood settings. Gary served as National Counsel to the National Charity Awards, a nonprofit organization closely affiliated to the White House. As National Legal Counsel from 1989 to 1993, Gary had the duty and privilege of meeting with world leaders, former and current U.S. presidents, U.S. senators, congressmen, and U.S. Supreme Court judges. His duties included working with numerous governors and state officials across the country, as well as a host of Hollywood's elite, renowned sports figures and other notables, bringing awareness to the president's favorite charities. Gary is chairman of the CBMC Atlanta Metro Area Leadership Team since March of 2010, representing the Christian Businessmen's Connection, CBMC, to businessmen and businesswomen of Georgia, and he is co-founder of the Greater Atlanta Business Network. Gary also serves as Chief Corporate Advisor to the Board of Directors of the Federal Invest. Investors Corporation. In his role with Federal Investors Corporation, Gary provides educational seminars to judges, attorneys, consumer advocate groups, legislatures, and executive branches of the of the Georgia state government. Like I'd like to introduce you, Dr. Gary Pernice. Welcome, everyone. My name is Gary Pernice. I'm the executive manager of the Platinum Business Group in Atlanta, Georgia, and we provide. Uh, commercial mortgage and equity funding services, business plans, business coaching in all 50 states around the country. We have uh, had a specialty with our Division of Church and Ministry Finance International of doing church loans and with our business partners over the last 40 years have funded more than 40, excuse me, $600 million worth of church loans. So we know something about the process of getting churches and businesses funded. And uh, I was asked to come and speak for a few minutes today and, and share some of the things that uh, have helped us uh, in our successes and tell you some of our failures uh, and also how Christ has involved himself in our lives, in our business, in our personal life. Uh, before I get started, I'd like to start out with a little bit of humor and kind of loosen everything up. Uh, and I'll tell you the story about it. it was a Sunday morning and the mother knocked on the bedroom door of her son. He said, son, it's time to get up and go to church. And he said, mama, I'm not going to church today. She said, son, you get out of that bed and you get ready for church. You are going. He said, no, mama, and I'll give you two reasons why I'm not going to church today. One, I don't like them, and two, they don't like me. She banged on that door. She said, son, you get that sorry tail out of that bed and you're going to church. I'll give you two reasons why. One, you're 47 years old, and two, you're their pastor. Come on. Listen, how many people here believe in miracles? All right. Yes. Everybody's hand is up? Yes. Okay. By the way, how much time do I have to speak? 20 minutes. 20 minutes. If you believe I'll finish any message in 20 minutes, you believe in miracles. <laughs> All right. Today, what I want to do is share about two minutes of my background. Some, some of you are familiar. Back, uh, everybody has two or three events in their life that are virtually transitional. Your life is never the same again. I'll give you some examples. The college you choose the day you graduate from college has a lot to do with the rest of your life. The person you marry or whether you choose to marry, your wedding day, you remember it for the rest of your life. Men, you may not remember the day, but you remember the event. Uh, Sometimes, as you had just said, you were in a life and death struggle when you were hit by a drunk driver. Candy Leitner was someone I worked with in the White House and I knew her. She was the founder of Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And uh, her life changed irrevocably, and then she changed millions of lives and laws all over the country as a result of the tragedy. One day in her life changed everything. In my case, one of the critical traditional uh, transitional dates was May 8, 1987. 
I was in Dallas, Texas on a routine visit to uh, my in-laws and uh, because of my 100 hour a week work schedule, uh, I had missed several ophthalmology appointments and so my wife scheduled at Scott and White Medical Center near Dallas uh, to have a full medical exam that day while I was on holiday so that I would sit still long enough to go through and get it done. On that day, the exam was supposed to take about an hour and then we would move on to Temple, Texas where we were going to spend the weekend. Unfortunately for me, that one hour turned into about an eight hour ordeal. I ran through about 60 or 70 different types of exams, not knowing what they were doing and getting frustrated and kind of angry about it. And uh, at 3.15 that afternoon, a gentleman who was my treating physician said, you have a malignancy. Get your affairs in order. It's in the late stages. I was later told that the survivor rate of the disease was less than 2% at one year and less than a half a percent at two years. That's a life-changing and pivotal moment. Over the course of recovering from that, I had to redo a whole lot of things in my life. I had become a Christian at Oral Roberts University on um, 1978, but I hadn't really made Jesus the Lord of my life until after this cancer experience. What I mean by that was, I knew how to make money, I was working hard, I would go to church on Sundays, but I basically wrote a check on Sunday morning, put it in the till, and felt that that was my Christian duty. Saturday night, all the way the rest of the week, all of that was my time to work on business and sometimes find a little bit of room for fan friends and family. That meant that my schedule was Lord of my life. And over the course of time, after being confronted with life-threatening cancer and watching everyone else in the study program perish before the end of the summer, being the sole survivor of that uh, experiment, um, was a real eye-opening experience. And so as a consequence of that, many things in my life changed. As a result, over the next several bouts of cancer, I ended up losing an eye uh, through the chemo, the radiation, and... Um, surgeries that were required. So God made sure that for the rest of my life, there's not a single day goes by that I don't remember and I'm not aware of what he did in my life. He got a hold of me. And so uh, God meant something about business. Now with that said, we tried a couple of different things. I got out of the practice of law, uh, which was killing me. And uh, I did have a passion for it, but so much so that there was no room for anything else. And it had some economic and personal consequences along the way. So eventually we started the Platinum Business Group. And the Platinum Business Group <clears throat> had a different focus in the initial days to where it is today. But we found our way by about 2004, we had begun to concentrate on commercial mortgage and equity funding. One of the things that was constant in my world was people saying, can you help me get money? It didn't matter if I did a business plan, created a, a, a nonprofit corporation, created an LLC or a company or whatever documentation people wanted. At the end of the day, there was one objective, to make money or to borrow money. And so uh, my natural inclinations went, uh, as Jesse James said, why did he rob banks? That's where the money is. So when we started our business, we eventually gravitated to the one area where there was constantly and would always be a need to help people organize their affairs, get the paperwork in order, get their accounts in order, and eventually qualify for funding or get their credit in such a way that they could get better rates and terms on um, assets that they needed to buy for their businesses. Through our experiences, we learned basically 10 really neat steps. And I wanted to be practical since we had 20 minutes and to have me talk for 20 minutes. I usually can't say my name and introduction in 20 minutes. So this is a challenge. We're, we're going to see if God has successfully helped me get more disciplined. But there are 10 principles that I wanted to share with you today that I think are practical and will help everybody in this room be better business people and perhaps even better people. The first lesson that I had to learn was sell something that people want to buy. We had all kinds of neat things that we were trying to do. We were all excited about and got very passionate about. And after about 100 turndowns out of 100 for things that people did not want, we woke up. We, were, we couldn't make up money 
in volume. <laughs> there just was no business for things that people do not want. So be sure that whatever business you are in, that it is a business that there is a demand. Our young lady over here is working as a tax uh, person and she does taxes for people. She has found an industry, like it or hate it, that will never ever go out of vogue. She has guaranteed business. The only difference is how busy does she stay? That's an element of her personality, her discipline, her focus, her marketing. But she will always have an opportunity to make a money, uh, regardless of what else she may choose to do in life. The second thing, and this is fundamental, and I learned this very hard, is get the cash flow flowing immediately. Yeah. We spent eight months designing our logo, our letterhead, and some of our materials, and never even attempted to sell a single thing. I wanted to, to be right. Well, <clears throat> as I was watching my savings dwindle fast, and people getting frustrated, when are you going to launch? When are you going to get this thing going? We finally started to sell. And uh, it was uncomfortable at first, but we started seeing sales almost immediately. And those sales were enough to sustain the cost of running the business, paying commissions, and keeping our sales staff uh, interested to continue. And then our logos and stuff modified and our branding developed. And over the course of about an 18 month period before we really landed where we wanted to be. And so get the cash flow running first, your branding will follow. That's not to mean you should ignore branding, but it's not the number one thing. It's getting a sale. I'd rather have a sale and no business card than have the best business cards in the world and never get a chance to launch because I went bankrupt in between. Another thing you wanna do when you're doing sales is to make sure you keep adding value. You're in the tax business as we said. Well, <clears throat> you can't hardly go down the street without hitting someone who's a bookkeeper, or a CPA, a tax person, or whatever. What distinguishes you from the next guy is what you add. Personal service, uh, you'll work after hours perhaps, you'll come to their, whatever it takes, that would distinguish you from, let's say, a nine to five CPA who is comfortable in his business. And if I'm someone who does not have normal hours, I really need flexibility, I might go to you, whereas someone who's a nine to five person would not consider it. But it's the marketing, it's the added value that would make someone like me come to you because it would be a personalized service. Another thing you can do about that would be to uh, do private labeling. Why create new stuff uh, out there when uh, there are products and services already available to you all you need to do is negotiate your deal and have it private labeled. You can be in business tomorrow. So these are the kinds of things to get the cash flow going. Always find a way to reduce your costs. Um, there's two ways to really make cash flow work, increase revenues or decrease overhead and costs. So you don't necessarily need a fancy office on day one. That'll come in time, uh, but you do need to have certain things you have to pay for. So you don't wanna be foolish uh, and just throw money away. And one of the neat things that you can control is if you have some funding in hand is to prepay for things and negotiate better deals. If you buy stuff in advance, generally you can negotiate a much deeper price break. And as a result, your price points and other things later on as you sell will be better because you've, caught, you've saved costs. So constantly try to work out deals with suppliers. It may be barter. Barter would not be a bad thing. If you have to have A, B, or C, and they need what you're gonna do, trade out. You're not spending hard-earned money uh, from your bank account when you barter. So that's another way that you might be able to help hold costs down. Uh, when you're planning, um, always try to understand your revenues. Um, it's so easy, and I'm the first to do this, which is why my office does not let me negotiate contracts, and that's not a lie. I do not negotiate our contracts. I do not. The reason is I grew up, everybody, I liked everybody, and they could see me coming. And I would discount and do all the rest of it. And discounting is where your profit is. And so the best way to do is to have a really fair price and make sure that it's competitive. But then rather than discounting, bring additional services to the table that you can throw in for no cost or nominal cost so it's value added. 
So again, let's use the tax for example. Maybe besides doing the taxes, she will have a full service business office available. So I can come in there while she's working on my taxes, I can be doing other business, and that makes her business more attractive than let's say a tax person down the street that's inside a, a, a Walmart. And so again, find things that you can add value with relatively nominal cost so your price doesn't need to come down because the price is where your profit is. Uh, you need to focus on sales and marketing. It's critical. All the fancy business cards, letterheads, offices, more, all, everything you could come up with is worthless if you don't have a sale. If you don't have a product that somebody wants to buy and no one can find you. So it's very important that nothing happens, to, important to know that nothing happens without a, without a sale. So forget the branding and the logos and the fancy letterheads and the cars and the business and all that stuff. Get into sales. Everything else can then follow. Find ways to increase your profit. Uh, that's the flip side of cutting cost. So if you have a product that um, is one color and it charges one dollar, but you find that no one else is selling colorful products and you add a little color for a few cents but you can double your price, you increase your profit. So cut your cost and find ways to increase your profits. So uh, a couple of things that uh, really is critical in trying to increase your uh, profit. The cost of leads is a fixed cost, whether you sell or not. So get your leads, then start converting leads into customers as early and as quickly as possible. I have a lot of leads. My customer list is a lot smaller. So once you find a person that is a customer, the next thing is do everything you can to increase their repeat business uh, any kind of opportunity that you can to give them an incentive to stay with you as opposed to looking at your competitors. And then <clears throat> try to increase the average um, distance between cost and, and uh, the price, which increases your profit. Uh, and then uh, try to increase the volume or rapidity, of the frequency of the sales. So those are things that you can do in that area. Next thing you want to do is test. It's not enough to um, put out a marketing piece. I put out a lot of marketing pieces. To this day, I don't know if they were effective. And sometimes I would say it didn't because I may have spent a lot of money to market something and I really didn't see any alteration or change in revenues. So chances were the marketing probably was ineffective, uh, but maybe the economy had dived and but for the advertising, I would have been bankrupt don't know because I didn't test. One way to do that is to send out uh, carefully worded pieces where they have to refer to a, a code to get a discount or an opportunity or a benefit or a bonus or whatever and do different uh, advertising pieces with different codes and you'll find which ones tend to be more effective and to what age group and what it may be ethnic oriented, it might be gender oriented, it might be age oriented whatever the case may be, and then you can start targeting demographics more effectively as you uh, learn to um, refine your message and test. Another thing that's very important, uh, most entrepreneurs uh, realize this, but it's usually too late. Learning is earning. If I had not altered any of my knowledge base when we started back 15, 16 years ago, I probably would have been bankrupt. By the school of reality, I had to constantly learn all kinds of things. I talked to a banker. If I didn't talk bank language to the banker, I was out of business. I had to talk church to the church, or I was out of business. I had to talk sales to the salespeople, or I was out of business. And so I had to start educating and training myself in all kinds of things that I never even knew existed. And so the more I became self-sufficient in the learning curve, the more effective I became as a leader, more profitable as a business, more successful in keeping business, more successful in bringing in new business. So learning becomes a really important key. Now, the more technical your business, 
uh, may require you to hire somebody with the skill sets that you need and recognizing what you can't really learn yourself and need to hire somebody is also a pretty important element. There's some things that took me about two or three years to realize there was never going to be enough knowledge curve learning to <laughs> outrun the distance. And let me give you an example. One of our business associates, Mr. Uh, Willis Kirk. Willis had been in the funding of church business since 1971. He had a broker dealer license. He had all kinds of degrees. He had funded more denominations than I knew existed. And that is not an exaggeration. I was not going to live long enough to put into my mind all the knowledge he had earned and accumulated for the past 30 years. So um, understanding when to hire the right person. Once we had Willis Kirk helping direct our church consulting business, our business mushroomed and it was an exciting period of time to be in that business. The collapse of the economy in August of 2008 took us uh, in bad situation there. and. Uh, I, we don't have time to go over that today. Finally, don't discount your, your services because you're cutting into your profit. Figure out ways to keep your price the same and again, try to add additional services that are nominal in cost. If you can do that, you'll find that your, your profitability continues to um, approach. Finally, Get professional coaching. If you cannot hire a service of a professional coach, find someone not in your business who you trust and respect with business knowledge to continue to go back and test things, ask things. It's in those discussions that you will find out uh, exactly uh, how to improve your business and profitability. I'm going to conclude in about one minute. Uh, many of the things that I've learned in life, health and business, uh, I had to learn the hard way. I think that's true with most people. And one of the neat stories that I'm going to share real quick is a lady by the name of Johnny Erickson Tata. Mm -hmm. She was an Olympian and she was 18 years old. She went to a private party. She was a swimmer. She was going to the Olympics as a swimmer. And she jumped off the board showing off or something of that nature, a freak accident. She became a quadriplegic and she was ruined. She never went to the Olympics. She never swam again. She's still in a wheelchair. She's learned to paint with her mouth. She's had children. She's got a radio and television programs and she's written books. And she has one of the neat sayings that I have actually put into my life very well. And I tried to understand why I had to deal with cancer, why I've lost a life, why I nearly went bankrupt, why I had to overcome so many challenges when I worked so hard and I was so dedicated and disciplined and passionate. And she said, very straightforwardly, God permits what he hates to accomplish what he loves. And so I had to rethink and learn that just because I was facing adversity was not necessarily a bad thing. It was a learning process. And if I didn't go through the adversities, chances were I was never going to grow and get to the next level. Thank you very much for your time and we can open up for questions.